Okay, I'm going to stand in the middle. I don't know if that's a good idea. And it might affect the audio on the recording, but. Um, uh, so I think I recognize almost everybody here. But for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jeff Hayes. Uh, I'm the interim dean of the Honors College. I have learned a lot about being a scientist this year. If some of you had to suffer through me uh, helping you get applications put together. Um, when I say the word maker scholarship, that just means anything outside of MSU, primarily nationally competitive scholarships or internationally competitive scholarships that we're going to be talking about today. Um, the sheet that went around, where's the experts? Ah, I don't need yours. There's no, oh, did I not print enough? I need oh, yeah. oh, they're over there. You guys need one? So, um, yeah, so make the scholarships nationally or internationally competitive scholarships for undergraduates. And we're going to talk about a couple of a fair number of these scholarships are really focused on graduate studies. Apply for them as a senior. Uh, we're also going to talk about scholarships you apply for in the sophomore, freshman, sophomore, junior, along the way. Um, and, and I want to. I want to just preface this whole conversation with sort of this elephant that, that is in the room with your, your student. I'm guessing a lot of you are kind of scared to apply for scholarships, right? No one wants to get rejected. Rejection sucks. Um, and, and so I think it helps if you just rearrange your thinking a little bit and see applying for a scholarship not as a, not as a competition, but a chance for you to really think about what you want to do with your life. Okay? Uh, every single, 100% of the students that I've helped put together a, a, a scholarship application this year, and that's been my degree students, every single one of them has really appreciated what they learned about themselves and going through that process. Is that true? You kind of know what you want to do ahead of time. Dell is different, he's special. But, it's it's a really good experience to put together a scholarship just so you have a, think, a, a chance to think about what you want to do with your life. The Rhodes Scholarship, which is the first one I'll talk about, is sort of the grandfather of all scholarships. Uh, they ask students, what's your fight? And I think it's really healthy to, decide, to think about what your fight is. And your fight will probably change, but it probably won't change 180 degrees. It'll probably you know, change more subtly than that. When I was a, a junior in, in college, same age as a lot of you, my fight was to clean stuff up. And I wanted to be an environmental engineer and clean up messes like the Berkeley did in, in New Montana. And then I discovered that I could, some of the tools that I was learning that I could use to attack human health problems. So my fight changed a little bit. But it's good to think about what your fight is now. So my goal is that by the end of our talk today, Everybody circles a couple of scholarships on here. Okay. So let's talk about there is a lot of scholarships out there. We are not going to go into detail on all of them. We're only going to go into detail on a few of them. But I wanted you to have this sheet because this is a pretty good an overview of what's available. And so the way this sheet works is what year are you? Starts at the top. The fewest scholarships are available to first year students. More and more as you go through. Okay. Next, you have to decide your area. STEM is pretty much it, it's it's usually the National Science Foundation, science, technology, engineering, math. Some scholarships are limited to STEM students. A lot of scholarships on here are focused on languages. Okay. A lot of the international scholarships are focused on language, and a lot of the scholarships are focused on public service. Okay? Public service is you, if you have some law that you think would make this state better, you want to do something to help this state or this country, that's public service. Okay. And then there's graduate study scholarships or another category on here. And then this sheet is organized by location. Where do you want to go next? Where do you want to go next summer? Where do you want to go next year? Where do you want to go three or four years from now? The first column is stay in the US. 
Middle column is abroad. Last column is summoned by. I know it's kind of weird for you to describe some of this work, but it's just the simplest way person that organized this organized. Okay, so all of you could put circles around some of these that you're potentially eligible for. And then you want to narrow down and decide, okay, of the ones I'm potentially an applicant for, which ones really describe me best? Okay. Um, so what's the process for applying for a major scholarship? So generally the way most of these works is, and this is for MSU, right? Generally the way most of these works is we have an internal, and I say competition, but it's usually not a competition. So usually we have an internal process. We say, give us a draft of your scholarship application a few weeks before the final application is due. Okay. In some cases, MSU can only submit a limited number of scholarships to the national competition. And so then we have a committee that picks which ones go forward. And in other cases, we can submit all of them. They all go forward. And in that case, what we're going to do is we're going to work with you to sort of clean up, polish your application. We're going to make sure you're meeting the scholarship criteria. We're going to make sure there's no, you know, silly typos, things like that. You also, for pretty much all of these, need letters of recommendation. You generally don't get to see the letters of recommendation. They'll come straight into the Honors College, and then uh, we'll help those letter writers, because they sometimes need help. We will help those letter writers sort of clean up their letters of recommendation. Often the letters we get are kind of generic, and we'll suggest language to the letter writers to make it more specific for this particular scholarship. Okay? So, you first send in draft application to the honors college, and then we help you. We we select in cases where we need to select, and and then we help polish it up. And then quite often the honors college, or precisely the dean of the honors college, which next year will be Dean Lee. Um, dean Lee is the one that actually hits the button to submit the scholarship. She'll upload most of the documents. It there, the rules vary from scholarship to scholarship. I'll highlight those differences. Generally, it's apply internally with the draft, polish, and then that. Um, oh, I want to say this ahead of time, Paul, also just to emphasize it. The, the Honors College helps all Montana State University students with these scholarships, right? So if anyone inside or outside the Honors College wants to apply for a scholarship, we will help them every time. Usually the Dean of the Honors College is called the institutional representative. And so they're the ones that sort of endorse the scholarship and they're the ones that submit it. We will help anyone. So if you have friends that are outside the Honors College, and they're like, man, I wish I could apply for a scholarship. They can, we will help them just the same as you. We help everybody, regardless of whether they're inside or outside of the Honors College. Oh, some of these scholarships have interviews. Uh, we will help you prepare for the interviews, usually with a mock interview or two, if it, if it comes to that. Okay, um, I'm going to go through the scholarships. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit some highlights now, just so you get a sense for what these scholarships are looking for. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the scholarships that MSU has had the most applicants for, the most recipients of in the past. This is not going to be an exhaustive list. You can see that from the sheet, right? It would take me hours to go through all of them, so I'm not going to. I'm just going to hit the highlights. I'm going to start with sort of the late stage scholarships, the scholarships you apply for either just before or during your senior year. These are scholarships mainly for graduate school. They all progressively get earlier and earlier. If you're a freshman, you might want to tune out for the next few, although you've worked for that young. A lot of these scholarships are they're kind of looking for a special person with a special set of experiences. So when I'm talking about the Rhodes Scholarship and you're a freshman, you might want to ask yourself, what could I do over the next year or two to actually fit the criteria of the Rhodes Scholarship? Because I really want to go to Oxford. If that's you, pay attention to what they're looking for. But if it's a few years before you apply, thinking about what they're looking for now is really helpful. Goldwater, all under beat this this point really heavily. 
So the Rhodes Scholarship, it funds two or three years at Oxford University, United Kingdom. Um, many of these scholarships that cover graduate school, the internal deadline is August 15, and that deadline rarely moves, right? So MSU's internal deadline is August 15. So if you are a junior, you're a junior in this room, going into your senior year next year, you want to apply for these scholarships for graduate school, this August 15 is when you want to have your draft submitted to the Honors College. Okay. Um, it requires an institutional endorsement. I don't, I never found a limit. I don't know that MSU has ever hit its limit. Basically, if you want to apply, we will review your application. And as long as it is a credible application, we'll, we'll endorse it. We sometimes choose not to endorse applications because students just give us. Uh, this year we endorse them all. Um, the Rhodes Scholarship, just as a uh, sort of to encourage you, it's an easy scholarship application. It's like one essay of a thousand words, right? And it's it's sort of a personal statement. The Rhodes Scholarship is kind of unique also in that that personal statement, I can't see it. Well, I can see it, but I cannot give you even a tiny ounce of feedback on it. Your personal statement is your own. The Rhodes Scholarship has strong prohibitions on you giving help with certain parts of the application. Pretty much all the other ones I can help you with the advice. Say, oh, you might want to say this differently. You might want to talk more about this. Rhodes, no, personal statement, I, I'm not allowed to give you any feedback whatsoever. Honestly, the most difficult part about the Rhodes Scholarship is they require more letters than everybody else. The Rhodes Scholarship requires five to eight letters. And really, it's eight, um, which is annoying, and it, it frustrates faculty that are writing letter after letter after letter. After. The hardest part of the world, so I'm going to give all those letters of recommendation. The criteria, academic excellence. Academic excellence is pretty much a criteria on every single scholarship I'm going to talk about, so I'm probably not going to repeat it, but they're always looking for a high GPA, which is usually what they mean by academic excellence. Uh, some of the language that the Rhodes uses, and, and and I write institutional endorsement letters when I write letters of support for your applications. I'll use some of the same application and I'll highlight things that you've done that fit this language. So using one's talents to the full, truth, courage, devotion to duty. And I like this one: sympathy for and protection of the weak. Let's imagine. You decide I'm going to apply for the scholarship next year. I'm like, I haven't really done anything that fits sympathy for and protection of the weak. You've got a whole summer to volunteer somewhere, maybe at the homeless shelter. Uh, I don't know what you want to do, but you've got a whole summer to think about how you might demonstrate to the Rhodes Committee sympathy for and protection of the weak. That's why I'm talking about this today and not later. Kindliness, unselfishness, moral force of character. It's a good one, right? How might you demonstrate that to the, the Rhodes Committee? And instincts will be, right? Almost all of these are going to be looking for leadership. Now ask yourself, what club could I lead here at MSU? What could I start here at MSU? A lot of these are going to be looking for leadership. Okay, any questions on Rhodes? Marshall is, is pretty similar to Rhodes. I don't know why we have all these famous scholarships to go study in England. Maybe because they have the old big famous universities. But uh, Marshall Scholarship funds graduate studies in the UK for two years. Uh, MSU's very first Marshall Scholarship was a student that I had in classes many times. His name is Brian Badhunt. Uh, he currently works for an NGO in the United Kingdom. But he mainly goes to Cambodia and helps their government with economic analysis of programs to help them uh, address climate change, which is it sounds like the most interesting job ever, if you ask me. Uh, but but uh, Brian Badheim went to the United Kingdom. He went to the London School of Economics, his undergraduate in chemical engineering, uh, and he sort of has that engineering slash economics skill set. He uses it. Uh, he uses it to his fullest. Brian's from Miles City, Montana. Was anybody from Miles City? 
Um, Marshall Scholarship requires an institutional endorsement. We can only submit 24 applications. We have never even come close to 24 applications, but next, I believe you guys next year, 24 applications. Um, if selected from MSU, the final application is due October 1. So you'll notice quite often the MSU deadline is roughly six weeks before the actual final deadline. And what we're looking for is a draft. Right? We're going to polish that draft. We're going to work with your letter writers. But uh, we've learned over the years it really helps to get a good lead time, good next months. Criteria. Um, this is what this is uh, language from the Marshall Scholarship. They seek candidates who are good scholars, leaders, blah, blah, blah. But this one's unique in that it's looking for sort of ambassadorial potential, right? So people that will help bridge between the United States and the United States. So now I want to think about what can I do to demonstrate ambassadorial Any questions on Marshall? Okay, let's talk about the Mitchell Scholarship. No one applied for the Mitchell Scholarship this year, and it's a crime because if there was one scholarship I could apply for, it'd probably be this one. Uh, it funds graduate studies in Ireland. Who does fund a graduate school in Ireland? It's like flash and green and beautiful. Um, it, it, the Mitchell is very close to the Marshall, which is graduate studies in Ireland. Uh, we have had students from MSU receive this scholarship. Uh, institutional endorsement is required, but there's no limits. Uh, criteria, characteristics sought by the review committee, academic excellence, said that too many times already, leadership, uh, commitment to community or public service. You also need, and I should have said this before, sorry, should have said this before, you also need to explain to the Mitchell committee, why do you need to go to graduate school in Ireland? What's different? What's available in Ireland that will help you with your mission in life? Maybe not available. So if you're thinking, I can graduate school in Ireland, you might want to look at programs that are available there that are kind of unique, that don't really fit elsewhere uh, because they're really looking for that. Same with, should have said this on roads, same with the Rhodes Scholarship. You want to say, why Oxford? Why do you need to go to Oxford for graduate school? Other than somewhere else, other than the fact it's fully paid for here for the scholarship, right? Why do you need to go to the London School of Economics or somewhere else? The Marshall, you can actually use at a number of different institutions in the United Kingdom. I, I think you are discouraged from using the Marshall to go to Oxford. Right, because the Marshall Committee says, ah, they should have just applied for the roads. Uh, so you kind of want to apply to places other than Oxford. Uh, Sheffield has a really fantastic university. Wouldn't it be fun to live in Sheffield for a year? Study for the Marshall Scholarship. By the way, I loved graduate school. It was like the happiest time of my life. Uh, so I will always encourage you, go to graduate school, go to graduate school, but it's so much fun. It's, you know, in college, I was going to college full time. I had a part time job to pay the bills. Graduate school, they paid me to go. I got a stipend. Tuition was paid for. It was you get to learn. Awesome. Um, Gates Cambridge Scholarship. So, this is one of the newer scholarships. It was established by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It funds graduate studies in Cambridge. This is a longer one. You can get this scholarship fully. For up to four years. I think this one includes things like travel costs, right? For flying back and forth between the UK and the US roughly every year. <clears throat> um, it's also different in that you don't need to go through MSU to apply for the scholarship. You apply to Cambridge, and part of that, there's like an add on application to the Cambridge application where you apply for the Gates Cambridge scholarship. Hillary Favich, another kind of here. One of my students. Yes, very proud of my students. Proud of you all. Uh, Hillary Fabich, I think, was the first recipient to the Gates Cambridge Scholarship in London. She was a chemical engineering student. How she got it was she reached out. She had done some undergraduate research here uh, on MRI imaging over in chemical engineering. She reached out to a researcher at Cambridge who was doing MRI imaging, and she said, "Hey." I want to come study, do graduate studies with you. 
Will you support my Gates Cambridge application? And so if you have a faculty member at Cambridge that says, yes, I'd love for you to come to Cambridge and be fully funded by the scholarship so I don't have to pay you. You can find somebody at Cambridge that like supports your application. Odds go up, up pretty quick. Um, so yeah, you don't need, MSU will help you if you want, but you don't need an institutional endorsement. You don't even need to tell us you're applying at the end of the day. We hope you will, but you, you don't need our help. Your letter writers, honestly, they probably need our help. So I encourage you to have your letter writers send drafts of their letters to the honors college and we'll, we'll help clean them up a little bit. Um, this, this scholarship is more focused on academics than the other ones. If you see yourself as just a pure nerd, this might be the scholarship for you. Um, yeah, uh, selection criteria, intellectual ability, Leadership potential, they don't even say leadership, just potential for leadership. Commitment to improving the lives of others. And I put in italics what I thought was the most important part, a good fit between the applicant's qualifications and aspirations and a good fit between the postgraduate program. So if you can find a postgraduate program, a graduate program at Cambridge um, that, that says, oh, you'd be great in our program, that really works. Yeah, this, this scholarship is easily worth $150,000, maybe $200,000. It's there's a lot of money behind this, right? Bill Gates gave Cambridge $210 million in balance. This is worth a lot. Hillary currently is president of a company down in Mexico. Um, any questions on Gates Cambridge? Okay, Marshall Scholarship. Sorry, Schwartzman's Scholarship. Uh, MSU's first recipient for the campaign chair, I'm sure. Um, so I'll know what I think is the best major on campus. <laughs> so, uh, the Schwartzman's is not short. Sure. Like four years, four years for the Gates Cambridge. I can't commit that much. That's way too much for me. Schwartzman is a one year scholarship. You go to Tsinghua in China, top university in China. Uh, you learn Chinese. The summer before you go down there, if you don't know any Chinese, you'll learn it quickly. Um, but it's in the Tsinghua University. This is called, or probably it's called the Chinese Rose. Right? So the Schwartzman's Foundation, when they set up this scholarship, they're like, we want something that looks like the Rhodes Scholarship, but instead of building bridges between the U.S. and the United Kingdom, we want to build bridges between the U.S. and China. Uh, you have to choose a focus area public policy, international relations, or economics and business. I believe you choose uh, something here that you're most interested in. This is probably not a scholar. This is, this is a scholarship for people that want to go more in a business route, right? Especially international business. No institutional endorsement is required. You actually submit directly. Uh, I guess it sort of mimics the Gates Cambridge in that way. Final application is due late September. Again, I hope you will take advantage of the support and help that the Honors College can provide, but it's not required. Successful, can successful candidates will demonstrate extraordinary leadership potential. Right? You're not leading a couple of clubs. Do it now. Um, although I don't remember Riley leading much of anything, although he was involved in pretty much everything, so. Uh, ability to anticipate paradigm changes. That's interesting language. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of paradigm changes coming, right? Whether it's climate change, whether it's, you know, manufacturing of computer chips, whether it's pandemics, all those sorts of things. But uh, yeah, ability to anticipate paradigm changes, strong intellectual capacity, an exemplary character. We didn't have anybody apply for the Schwartzmans this year either. So next year. Any questions on Schwartzman? Okay, this is uh, pretty much everything we've talked about is all study abroad. We're going to continue that theme on steroids here. So Fulbright is the classical way to travel abroad, right? Uh, we all know traveling abroad as a as an undergraduate is expensive, traveling abroad as an undergraduate is difficult, Fulbright will pave the way for you. Um, you apply as a senior, 
uh, August 15th. So you're really almost thinking about being a senior on August 15th. But uh, if you're a junior, you would apply uh, internally August 15th. I think internally we have two interviews. We often often reach our limit on applications here. Institutional endorsement is required. Um, I actually didn't get involved much in the Fulbright. There's a committee um, consisting of people inside and outside the Honors College that handles it. Final applications are due at early October. So what you need to know about Fulbright, I want you to remember are there two categories. There are very different, two very different categories of Fulbright applications. Category number one is if you want to do research about some other place in the world, that is the first category, right? Grants for individually designed uh, study and research projects. The most recent one that I'm familiar with is a person who went to Jordan, the country Jordan this year. He was interested in water, water rights, use of water, things like that in one of the driest places on the planet, uh, Israel and Jordan and that area. He was interested in the history of water use. He was interested in the history of water rights. What do we do when we have countries using the river as a border? Who has the rights to the water? How do they negotiate those rights? That's a individually designed research project. You got a Fulbright to go to Jordan and do that research. The other way you can do Fulbright is you can teach English somewhere else in the world. This one, uh, your odds of getting the grant are a lot higher. So if you say, I want to go to Spain, uh, I have a student to apply to do, uh, do the English teaching assistant program in Spain this coming year. And I think they're a finalist. We haven't heard yet if they're going to get it or not. Um, but if you just want to go somewhere in the world, live there and teach English for the year on Fulbright, great way to do it. Key criteria. Uh, quality and, and feasibility of the proposal, that just applies to the first type of proposal, right? The research project proposal. They want to make sure what you want to do is, is feasible. You've got a finite period of time, probably want to have contacts with wherever you're going that are going to help you with the research, things like that. Um, and then language preparation, right? If you're going to go teach English somewhere, you probably just need to be able to speak the language wherever you're going sufficiently well uh, to find programs. So yeah, Fulbright, I think we had at least nine MSU students apply for Fulbrights this year, and we had like seven finals. We haven't heard yet. So this is one of the this is one of those scholarships where we can usually get a lot of money. Who doesn't want to travel around the world for free for you? Foreign scholarships uh, are not administered through the Honors College. They're administered uh, through the Office of International Programs, but I wanted you to know about them. I'm very, I'm not very familiar with them. Um, but basically the goal here is that the US government will pay for you to go somewhere else in the world and learn a language that is considered a strategic US need, right? Um, so basically, you know, any place where it's a rare language and they want and the US wants to make sure we have a sufficient cohort of people that can speak that rare language from somewhere else in the world. And, uh, speak that rare language used somewhere else in the world. Um, so yeah, they want highly motivated individuals who wish to work in the federal national security area. I think, yeah, in exchange for funding, you agree to work for the federal government for at least one year after graduation. So they send you somewhere. You study a language for a year and then you come back and you pay for the whole two years and everything. But it's, yeah, it's a fair amount of money uh, and support. It's, you know, it's it's weird. When you look at this list of countries and regions of the world, it all made sense to me, except for one, right? It made sense to me. The U.S. wants to make sure we have expertise in a number of different languages from Africa, a number of different languages from Asia, Central and Eastern Europe. Right? We need people that can speak Romanian and Hungarian and uh, other languages. But then I hit Latin America. <laughs> uh, I have no explanation for that. Sort of weird. And the Middle East makes sense. Yeah, foreign is is pretty cool. If you you'd like to learn languages, you travel around, have the U.S. government pay for it. 
um, the Warren Scholarship is for you. So uh, National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Program. So this is something you can apply for in your senior year. Uh, I didn't have, I didn't check, oh, I didn't put the due dates on here. I think the due date for this one is October, like early October, maybe late September. The Honors College almost never sees these, okay? Uh, most students that apply for the NSF, the GRFP, most people that apply for the NSF GRFP just apply directly to the National Science Foundation. If you get it, it's uh, 40,000 year per year stipend. That's your salary. Uh, plus, they cover the cost of tuition. They give you an allowance for fees and books. Uh, I think the National Science Foundation estimates that every time they give one of these out, it costs them four thousand, four hundred thousand dollars or something like that. Because if you go to graduate school at MIT, the tuition there is like sixty, seventy thousand a year, and NSF is paying that. So it's a lot of money. Uh, no institutional endorsement is required. If students apply directly. There are a few individuals. I'm one of them. There's a few individuals on campus that have reviewed these applications for a long time. I've, I've probably reviewed over, a, I, I reviewed for the National Science Foundation. I've reviewed probably a thousand applications from students from around the country and from around the world for this. The National Science Foundation is looking for, oh, by the way, uh, you have to be in a STEM field, right? This is NSF's rule, it's not my rule. But the NSF has a list of disciplines that they'll fund. Um, if you've got a 3.9 GPA, a peer reviewed publication really helps. It's not essential, it's not required, but it really helps. Um, you also have to write a research proposal. And this last part I put in italics because every student I've ever worked with on their application fails to do this well at first. Uh, NSF is looking for funding students that are also going to sort of share the joy of science with the community around them. And so, um, you know, if you've ever done any outreach type work, uh, the, um, the NASA, uh, the NASA group is pretty famous with their balloons, right? They go to middle school around, uh, around Gallant County and around the state. But if you've ever done any sort of scientific outreach to, to other students, that would really strengthen your application. What uh, I want you to remember here is if you, plan to apply for this, talk to somebody on this campus that has served as a reviewer. I know a lot of them. I am happy to help review your application. Just having a few experienced reviewers give you feedback on your application here will really help. I think your application is like a three-page personal statement, sort of tell your story, why you're interested in science, why you want to go to graduate school, and then you have a two-page research proposal. And I'm, I'm happy to help you with all those things, give you feedback on them. But it's you know, it takes you maybe, I don't know, 20 hours to put together an application and it's worth $400,000. The potential return on investment there is pretty high. I think they fund maybe five to 10% of it, so it's not bad. Okay, questions, comments? Yeah. I think the honors college gets a lot of it. You see a lot of the applications. For the NSF GRFP? Yeah. Um, I tradition by tradition, right? Um, I think what Dean Lee would do if the student said, "Oh, I'm going to write a GRFP application," she'd send them to me over an engineer to say, "Go talk to Jeff; he's helping me." And so I think the Honors College historically has sort of farmed out that application support. Okay, we're moving earlier in time. A little earlier in time, uh, the Truman is a weird one, right? The Truman you apply for in the middle of your junior year, and it funds your graduate studies, which is kind of weird. Right? The Truman is, you know, is kind of a weird one. So you apply as a junior, right? Smack dab in the middle of your junior year. So if you're a sophomore, you want to be thinking about the Truman because um, next year you'll be on campus. Come. Uh, the application is due mid-December. So if you're a sophomore, next December is when your uh, draft application will be due. 
So uh, MSU internal deadline is mid December. The institution can only submit four applications for Truman. That means that if you go forward from MSU, you've got a decent chance. I think Truman funds one per state. So if you are from a state like Montana, few people, you got a better chance. Um, here for New York, uh, good luck. Um, let's see. So the Truman Scholarship is is the most famous scholarship for people that have a passion for public service, right? So if uh, part of the application process, in fact, the main part of the application process is you have to write a public policy statement at two pages. You can propose some new policy. When I think about this, I wrote it at the bottom. If you could make one new law at the state or national level, right? You need a magic wand to make a new law to make this world better. You have an idea, that's a Truman application, right? I don't know what that is. If I had to do it, it'd be a carbon tax of some kind, because I believe very strongly that that's the thing we need the most. I have no idea what it is for you. Um, we had one Truman finalist this year. Uh, she went to Seattle. In her, year. her public policy was we need better mental health uh, resources available to rural farmers in the United States. And she'd been doing research on this topic for about a year, but she had the data to back up her public policy statement. It was a really good, it was a really good statement. I was really impressed. Um, a record of public service is, is useful, right? So if you've ever volunteered in a campaign, if you've ever you know, volunteered as a Senate page or something like that, uh, this is for you. But if you're a history major if you, and you've been feeling left out by all the STEM scholarships, this is a, a good chance. So, yeah, it's for people that intend to pursue a career in public service. That might be nonprofits. That might mean you want to work for the Department of the Interior. That might mean you want to work for the Forest Service. I don't know what it means, but uh, that's what the Truman Scholarship is for. The Truman Scholarship will change your life. Okay? And here's how. You get the Truman Scholarship in the summer, I think in the summer between your junior and senior years. All right, so this is when you're thinking about where you're going to apply to graduate school. They fly all 55 Truman Scholars to one place. And then uh, all the universities in the United States, well, at least the two or 300 biggest universities in the United States, fly representatives to that same place. And you get to pick your university where you want to go to graduate school, right? The Truman's not that much money, but what these universities recognize is attracting a Truman scholar into their graduate program is a big deal. Just go there, and you're like, I don't even know what know what the proper metaphor is. Um, but yeah, all these universities are clamoring for you. You can decide where you want to go. To graduate school. The Truman is is life changing. Not so much for the money, but for the door. Udall scholarship. So Udall, you apply as a sophomore or junior. It typically will fund either your junior year and senior year or just your senior year. So it applies whatever it, it, it uh, supports, whatever you've got left. Like the Truman, it's not that much money, but it has a transformative impact in terms of the doors that it opens. Uh, institutional Endorsement is required. There's no limit. We had three um, Udall scholars go in this year. There's three categories with the Udall scholarship, and I want to emphasize this. Um, the first category is the only category that's open to anyone, and there you're applying for a Udall scholarship based on your interest in environmental public policy. So if you have some environmental policy ideas, that just would be for you. The last two categories are limited to Native American or Alaska Native students. So if you have a membership, a tribal membership, the competition here is significantly less, right? You've got a, a, a very good shot uh, at the Udall Scholarship if you put together a good application. Uh, but you apply in the area of tribal health care or tribal public policy. They look at leadership, service, and 
Questions on you, Don? Cold water. Probably the one that MSU talks about the most. Um, you apply as a sophomore or a junior. Most of the applications that go forward are from juniors. It is $7,500. That might have gone up. That data might be a little outdated. Um, and you can get it for, again, one or two years, depending on whether you're applying as a sophomore or a junior. Oh, I should, I should mention this. With all of these scholarships, when I use terms like sophomore or junior, I am not talking about the number of credits you have. They don't care about this. Talking about sophomores, I'm talking about people that have two more years until they graduate. Talking about juniors, talking about people that have one more year before they graduate. So when we talk about sophomore class standing, sophomore, junior, senior, what we're talking about is years until you graduate. And if you're a December graduate, uh, it gets messy and it, it, every scholarship handles it a little differently. Okay. Uh, institutional endorsement is required. MSU can only submit four. There is a wild card there where if you transferred into Montana State University from another university, they allow up to five. MSU has pretty much every year for the last decade, we have submitted the maximum that we could. Right? So we typically will get seven or eight applications, internal applications, and we'll select the top four. It's pretty competitive because they fund, they're funded at a pretty high rate. What are they looking for? They claim that you need a GPA of 3.8 or higher, but in practice, you really need a GPA of 3.9 or higher. Uh, it has to be in a STEM field, uh, and they typically really look for a peer-reviewed publication. They really like something that's up here. So, some of you are freshmen. You are freshmen and sophomores. The Honors College has funds to support you doing research in a lab around campus. You're like, oh, no, I need to get started on research in a lab. We have money to help pay you. Okay, so uh, the reason why I'm emphasizing this is it takes a long time to do enough research in the lab. That you actually get your name on a paper. That takes time. And so what I want is to maximize the chances of everyone starting early. If you're a freshman, perfect time to start doing research in the lab. Right? You might do it during the summer. Get a great foundation to go in. Do it next year. Once you've been in a lab for a year, year and a half, now's a time where you're probably working with the graduate student on a publication to get your name on the publication. Okay? Uh, so yeah, I want everybody to be competitive for the Goldwater Scholarship. That means, you know, the earlier the better in terms of doing research in the lab. Yeah. So typically, um, it, it, it really depends on the faculty advisors, right? I think what a lot of faculty advisors do, and I like this, they will partner an undergraduate up with the graduate students, and you'll pretty much start off by doing the experiment with the graduate students. That you're learning, right? And maybe six months in, you're starting to do experiments independently from that graduate students. Now, at the end of the day, that graduate student is probably going to be the first name on the paper, right? Because they've probably been working on this for 50 hours a week for three years. You've probably been working on it for 10 to 20 hours a week for a year. So you're probably the second or third author because you've done some experiments to help support the research. You've, you know, done some data analysis now. That, that's a, a, a classic model. Now, occasionally, you come across a faculty member that will have this wild harebrained idea. Be like, I got this idea. I doubt it'll work. Uh, and I can't put a graduate student on it because, well, if it doesn't work, they won't get a thesis and that'll be bad. And they put an undergraduate student on their own project. It's it's higher risk, higher reward. And and if you ever want to sort of talk through scenarios with me, I'm happy to talk through scenarios with you. Um, but yeah, you, you can find all all different models. The, the traditional model is you're partnered with a graduate student. And eventually you start to sort of graduate from that point. Yeah. We talked about getting paid while working in a lab. Like, mm -hmm. how does that work? Like, you get paid you for working in a lab. I was thinking. So, uh, how does that, I mean, you, you're basically an MSU employee. 
Uh, you get paid by the hour. Um, typically, the pay is not great. It's twelve, thirteen dollars an hour. But yeah. I, I thought you just got paid. So no, crazy. no. If it is, it, it depends on the field. Uh, the norms vary from field to field. Um, but typically, yeah, you would get paid by the hour for doing research in the lab. You can also get credit, like depending on the major that you're pursuing. Uh, you can quite often get independent study credit for doing that, which is really nice. Right, you get both credit and you get paid for it all at the same time. It's magical. Yeah. Me in. Let's go. You count me in. So when I say sophomore year, let's say you're five years, you're three is your sophomore year. Four the gold water. Right? Yeah, yeah. You count me in. Years until graduation. Yeah. So it depends. Uh, my memory is that Goldwater has a strict floor of 3.7. They won't allow us to submit a uh, 365. Um, when I was making these slides late last night and cut and pasted, it said 3.8 and I just left it. I, am, uh, I don't know that MSU has submitted, has sent one forward with a 3.8 before. Or with a 3.75, I guess I should say. Uh, we submitted one this year that had a So we'll submit them. You should just know your odds of getting the award are significantly higher if you're in two years. This is kind of dumb. It's not my rules. Wait, is that is that backwards counting um, the same for all these scholarships? Pretty much. Okay. Pretty much all. It's years. Yeah, sophomores are year two years. Astronaut scholarship, this is brand new. This is the very first year MSU has been allowed to submit. Um, we had the meeting earlier this week to pick the two applications that are going forward. The astronaut scholarship was actually modeled after the gold water. That's why I put these two together. You apply as a sophomore or junior, you have to be in the STEM field. $15,000 per year, that's pretty nice. Potentially for two years, up to two years. Uh, MSU can only submit two of these. The competition is going to be pretty high, uh, but if you're a freshman or a sophomore, please consider applying for the Astronaut Scholarship Fund next year. Um, yeah, the criteria are pretty similar to Goldwater. They're looking for a 3.9 GPA. I don't have a sense for whether or not they're looking for your name to be on the publication, but certainly doing having experience doing research in a lab would be valuable. Uh, they look for display. They talk a lot. I guess this is this, 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 this sort of astronaut theme. They seem to value creativity, imagination, daring, sort of astronauty, at least in my mind, astronaut. I'm making up words when I say astronaut. Yeah, uh, this is this will be, I'm guessing, a pretty popular one going. Okay, so we've only scratched the surface, right? The blue sheets that I passed out, they're a much more comprehensive list. Uh, there are more beyond the blue sheet. And if you want to apply for a nationally or internationally competitive scholarship, we will help you. Uh, we just, the ones I went through today are the ones we really have a lot of experience with. So that means we can be more helpful. If it's something we've never seen before, we're gonna be less helpful, just because we don't have experience. Questions, comments, screens of frustration. So, do students usually only apply for one of these, or do you like recommend that they apply, like, at least try to apply to two of these? They almost always apply to multiple ones. Uh, it's it's rare that they apply to a bunch in the same year. But what's very common, for example, is if you win the UDAL. Apply for you know, all as a sophomore, you get it. You're almost certainly going to be encouraged to apply for the roads because that you all know, win really carries a lot of weight. It's it, it's frustrating to me 
right? It's sort of the rich getting richer problem. Um, but at the same time, it's reality. And so if you win the email, the dean and the office colleague is going to encourage you to apply for the roads. There's not a limit on the number of applications we you can submit. So you might as well submit it. You've already got the letters for recommendation. Yeah. You've probably got a pretty good personal statement. So you know you can sort of take a day to morph that UDAL application into a road application. And so UDAL win is a is a big hammer in, in helping you get the most stuff. So it's very common that students will apply for multiple of these scholarships, often in different years. But we had somebody this year that applied for the Marshall, the Gates Cambridge, and the Rose. And it, it was efficient, right? I got letters of recommendation, and, and you know, I was able to get you know just a few edits, and it's sufficient. So the senior year, I guess, yeah, multiple. As a letter writer, as a person who writes lots of letters of recommendation, I strongly support students applying 10 small letters. It's the first time I wrote that letter, it was hard. Every time I after that, it's been short. Oh, summertime. We're the last busy in the summer. Right, so I always encourage students to be thinking about, let's imagine you're a junior, you've got a couple of these scholarships circled that you're going to apply for for the August 15 deadline. Uh, you don't want to be thinking about your letter writers and probably approaching them at the end of the semester. Because faculty will say anything, yes to anything now that doesn't actually become due in the August. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would typically give letter writers a month or two. Regardless of when you do, and and the more you can include summer in that month or two, the more likely people are to say to say yes. When it comes to letter writers, you want to pay attention to the scholarship criteria. So if the Goldwater Scholarship, right, and they're looking for people that are going to pursue careers in math, blah blah blah, demonstrated blah blah, blah folks, you want people that can speak about your ability to do well in the classroom and to do well in the lab. If you're applying for UDAL, you want people that can speak to your commitment to public service. <laughs> right? Uh, if, if you're applying for UDAL, you want people that can speak to your integrity. You want people that can speak to your leadership. I typically, you know, most of these, they require two letters of recommendation. I would say you want at least two down the back. People that can say, give this person a scholarship to go to graduate school. They will do well in the classroom. It is up to you. It, it kind of depends on the scholarship, kind of depends on what you write in the letter. Um, I have the weakest letters that I've seen this year are all from outside of Michigan. But the strongest, some of the strongest letters I've also seen. Uh, they're, it's much more stochastic outside. And I had a much harder time with outside writers in getting them to make the edits that I think need to be made. Internal people, I can sort of twist their arms. <laughs> or I can bring the beer. <laughs> but yeah, this, this is a reminder. Introduce yourself to your professors. Get to know your professors. Make sure they know your name, because you're probably going to need letters from The um, scholarship was this. oh the road scholarship. I was on this this webinar for the road scholarship, and the challenge the road scholarship has is in the past they've been awarding the road scholarship to students that then can't get into the uh, Oxford. Sorry, Oxford. Oxford's admission requirements are so absurdly high that they have individuals that win the road scholarship and they can't get into Oxford. And so you need the letter writers that can say, to give this individual the scholarship, they will do really well in the class. Scholarship and go get They can apply to Oxford the next year. Those will hold their scholarship for a year. They still don't get into the next year. So, you have a year to clean up that application. Okay, if you have more questions, 
literally drill a hole in that wall and you'll be in my office. So anytime you have questions, stop by. But please, please, please apply for at least a couple of weeks, right? You will be a better person for it. Having some time to think about your leadership, your service, your integrity, it, it, it's really good for you. Lenny. Oh, um, I'm surprised you haven't already. Probably within a couple of days. You might poke your head in, in uh, Stephen's office. I I have not seen him today. He's had a. I won't get into the details. He's had a tough. Okay. Thank you, everybody.